and now welcoming people to a Korea Bridge Hangout being streamed live on August 1st, 2011. Uh, tonight, gathered a couple guys to talk about tech in Korea. Uh, this is Jeff Lebo in Pusan, joined by... Uh, I'm uh, Matthew Wigand in Seoul. And I'm Stafford Lumsden, also uh, in Seoul. It's a Hangout. No, uh, no real agenda, although Matthew wrote a very oh. interesting piece about privacy in Korea. Um, but before we talk about that, uh, we should probably talk a little bit about who you guys are, what you're doing here, how long you've been here. Matthew, what you doing here in Korea? Okay, I'm, uh, <clears throat> I'm here in Korea working as, uh, as a journalist and as an editor for a couple of magazines here. I write about technology-related things, and um, I do a lot of editing on the side. And uh, what I do rarely, but what I like to get into more um, <clears throat> more often, is uh, doing web design. I've set up a couple of websites for different organizations or people here in Korea, and I'd like to continue to do that, doing my small part to try to uh, revolutionize Korean web design and take it out of the 1990s and into the 21st century. Well, quite a few follow-up questions there. Uh, first, do you, have a, <laughs> do you have a website or a URL to plug where people can check you out? Um, well, uh, like for a portfolio, unfortunately, I don't have one right now. But I've just been, it's just kind of like a hobby I do. So I've made a couple of websites. Like you could go check out uh, biztechreport.com. And uh, that's where the article was that you mentioned earlier. And I've also made the website for that magazine. All right. And so you're, you're a, a working geek and writer here in Korea. That's, that's living the dream. Well, it's, it's pretty fun, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a lot of people here who would, you know, uh, like to earn their living uh, doing that stuff. Speaking of which, Stafford, how are you earning your living and what else are you doing these days? Uh, like so many other people here, I, I spend my day uh, in a classroom. So my, my day job is uh, I, I'm a, uh, a teacher instructor at uh, Seoul National University of Education. Um, and by night, if I'm not sleeping, uh, I am... Uh, 10 Magazine's Tech and Gear columnist, um, avid blogger, um, raconteur, man about town, um, all of those sorts of things, yeah. See, I didn't even know that you had proper credentials to be on the uh, geek episode. I just knew you were a geek from your <laughs> posts, but wow. How's that for validation? I've even got a press card somewhere. Wow. Let me through on press. Well, I'm important. <laughs> I'm, I'm honored to be in the presence of such geeks. Uh, so, Matthew, tell us a little bit about this article you published this week. Uh, yeah, it's um, it's about uh, an event that happened actually in the beginning of May. It just has been um, a little while for it to go through the magazine process. Um, basically, the, the South Korean government has been harassing Google. This time, this most recent time, it was South Korean government concerned that Google was tracking uh, user, Android users' uh, geographic locations to serve them up mobile internet ads on their Android operating system phones. So they, uh, Korean police, Seoul police, I guess, raided Google's offices and uh, confiscated some hardware and made a big show out of uh, being tough, tough on Google and tough on privacy. Actually, I haven't actually heard any follow-ups to this since May. I don't know if actually anything's going to happen further, but uh, it just, that's what the article is about. And now this is pretty similar to what Apple was they filed a lawsuit against Apple just a couple of weeks ago about this kind of tracking as well, right? Yeah. Um, originally, well, originally the whole thing broke open in the U.S., in the U.S. media. Apple's uh, iPhone and iPad um, models were found to be tracking geographic locations in a text file somewhere in the operating system. 
And so that was the big scandal in the US. Then people also started questioning Android phones. And then um, it also came out that Android phones might be also keeping track of like the last 10 or 15 locations that person's been in. So yeah, um, I don't think there's any Apple corporate offices here in Korea, so the Korean government couldn't go after them, but they did go after Google. Now, I tend to think of Google as the relatively benevolent digital overlords of our uh, identities, but what is the concern here? What will they potentially do with this data? Well, the bread and butter of Google, all of Google services are advertising, and they may potentially send you an ad for Starbucks when you are walking by a Starbucks, or they may potentially give you a Nike ad as you're passing the Nike store. Or they could, uh, well... Could they do could flash they do one plus one sales? Um, as you walk by Starbucks, a one plus one latte, all right. <laughs> well, it depends on how, what you have installed, I guess, on your smartphone. Um, you, you've got to remember too that the, the, the thing is twofold. Yes, it is serving ads um, on that very local level, but I mean, I, I think part of it is also the fact that they're using this data to improve location services, to improve the, the you know the actual location data, so that they can be more accurate. Um, and you know, when you flick on your GPS on your Android phone, or in fact on your on your iPhone. Um, the, um, the, the, the case with the iPhone is interesting in that Apple openly admitted in its, in its URL, sorry, in its EULA, that it was collecting this information. Um, the problem was that it didn't, it didn't let people know the extent to which it was collecting the information. Um, I think you said, Matt, that um, you know, Google was collecting 10 or 15 of the last places you visited. That was the assumption people had with the, um, the iPhone, when in actual fact it was closer to the last 50 to 100. And that's why people got upset initially, I think. Um, and then, of course, you know, the mainstream media got onto it and blew it well out of proportion. And the, the greater problem with this kind of information is not, not always what its intended purpose is. The big problem with tracking information like this is that a third party can get a hold of it and uh, start stalking you. If, you. if you have a really... Um, similar routine that you go through every day, and that routine is recorded on your phone, and your jealous boyfriend or angry mobster who you owe money to wants to know exactly where you are at all times, they might be able to hack your phone, download the data, and harm you in some way. So it's not really, partially it's about what its intended use is, but partially is the fact that the data exists at all. Some people think that the data should just not exist in any form whatsoever. Yeah, see, whereas I, I'm the complete opposite. I, I'm a, an avid user of Google Latitude um, and, and choose to let Google and, in fact, the world know where I am 24 hours a day, pretty much. All you have to do is, is log into Latitude to find out where I am. Um, I think, Jeff, you, know, you were saying that Google is our rather benevolent overlord. Um, I, I'd be happy for them to know more about where I am, what I'm doing, and, and serve me ads and content as appropriate. Which, it's one th as long as it's opt-in... And yeah. is, is any of this not opt-in? I mean, you, everyone can turn their GPS off, right? Well, in the case of the iPhone, um, I, I think it's, it's, um, you don't have as much control. But if you're installing an Android app, every time you install an Android app, it gives you the chance to look at the options to see what this application does and to check or uncheck things that you're not happy with. Um, you know, as with a lot of things, I think it comes down to the end user being aware um, of the option to opt out than you know, than just blindly clicking accept, 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 accept. You know, has Google responded to this at all, here or the states or anywhere? Um, here, they just released a very brief statement saying that they were cooperating with authorities fully, which is similar to the other times when their offices have been raided. And uh, I haven't really heard anything else after that. And I was interested in the line in your article where they mentioned that the Korean authorities were dissatisfied because a lot of the records they really wanted were in the U.S. Now, does that mean they don't have access to those records? And if they request them, Google doesn't have to or will not give them to them? Yeah, it means that they don't have access to them. And um, Google has 
the precedence of not cooperating with the Korean government when the Korean government makes demands of them. For instance, uh, back in 2009, I think it was, the Korean government started uh, passing or passed or started enforcing a law where websites with more than 200,000 users had to record the user's real name and the national ID number during signups. And they uh, started getting after Google for not complying with that regulation. Google decided that instead of complying with the regulation, they would just not allow people from Korea to sign up at uh, youtube.co.kr. Which is why we cannot that. upload videos to YouTube from Korea unless you set your, your location to worldwide. Yeah, which is a very small inconvenience for Korean users and for Google and a very large uh, insult, I guess, to the Korean government's regulations. A stern middle finger up in the air from Google. Well done. Yes. I wonder, too, if there hasn't been any um, talk about this lately um, because of the giant SciWorld um, security breach that happened uh, last week with um, 35 million odd members result, you know, details being apparently stolen by people in China. Well, that is... Um, I'm sorry, my dogs are kind of out of control now. They don't like China, obviously. They're upset about it as well, I understand. <laughs> yeah, they seem to be... They're young and extremely vigilant. Um, yeah, that's the... Well, that's the uh, negative side of these kind of regulations that the Korean government would like to have. Even though they say that they're protecting users' privacy and that not any anyone, no one except the Korean government should be able to access information about users' real names and national ID numbers. Just the fact that the information exists in some form is a risk because, as you can see, Chinese hackers can and do steal 35 million Cyworld and Nate users' information, which on a website like um, Google or Yahoo or something may be less important, but on a website like SciWorld and Nate, where users real social security number basically and real identifying inf enough information to fake their bank account is stored, then the security be then the issue becomes a lot more serious. So. Looking at the whole pri privacy issue overall, what, what's your recommendation? What do you think should happen? Mm. Uh, first of all, is, is this regulated at all? Uh, here, there, anywhere? Well, it's too new. The, here in Korea, the privacy, privacy is actually discouraged by regulation. So my recommendation, of course, would be I'm all for not prevent. I'm all for preventing huge breaches of data and inconvenience for millions of people. So I would be all about anonymizing the users of internet portals like SciWorld and Nate, not requiring them to give their national ID number, and uh, just letting them register with email address the way things are done in uh, other parts of the world. Of course, I'm a, you know, radical geek extremist. <laughs> or rational, as the case may be. <laughs> I would have uh, raised against the machine in Libya or, you know, <laughs> other stuff like that if I had the opportunity. Uh, how would you characterize freedom of... Not, I don't know if you call it freedom of speech online or overall openness of the net in Korea compared to other countries. Stafford, do you want to take this? Um, you know, uh, for me personally, um, you know, it's as open as anywhere else in the world. Um, I, I get by on the old security by obscurity. No one knows who I am. No one gives a damn who I am, really. So I can pretty much say what I want. Um, However, you know, if I were to say something that irked someone in government, um, I think 
if I'm outside of China or Syria or somewhere like that, Korea is probably one of the more likely places where I might uh, have a run-in with the with the Dong Daemun cyber security team. You know, um, it's always it's always worried me how it's always Dong Daemun police station that's in charge of cyber security, but that's probably another story altogether. Um, yeah, I mean, I think earlier this year um, there was a, a listing of you know the most open internet spaces in the world and. You know, South Korea was way down the list, you know, and you only have to look at cases like Minerva to know that um, you know, the government is quite happy to step in and slap people around when they're um, you know criticizing them on the internet. And for people who don't know who Minerva is, can you give us the two sentence summary? Uh, Minerva was a uh, an armchair economic pundit um, who quite uh, qu qu predicted the whole economic meltdown of, of a year ago quite accurately from his um, his armchair somewhere in, in Guangzhou, I think he was, <laughs> in the end. <laughs> yeah. Now, he, um, he, he criticized the economic policies of the current yeah. government, um, and so they arrested him, even though he was absolutely 100% right. On what um, grounds? Was it just for criticizing the current administration, or was it something else? Um, well, I think... Um, you, you, I, I mean, Matt might be able to correct me here. Um, I, I think it was a combination of... Um, Korea's defamation laws, and you're not supposed to use. I, I think the the legislation says the telephone um, to to spread panic, um, and that's that's what they got him on. He was sort of um, putting the cat amongst the pigeons, and that's not allowed. Yeah, there was also there was an aspect of um, spreading false information online, which was supposedly illegal. But, and supposedly false, <laughs> but it turned out to be quite accurate. Yeah, but if you look at any you know stream of YouTube comments or a chat room or something online, if you were if spreading false information online was really illegal, then pretty much I think every single person in the world would be in jail right now. Mm. Although the way you know the the internet works in in Korea, people really latch on. <laughs> To certain um, personalities within, you know, the blogosphere or within what I like to call the cafe sphere here in Korea, because you know, Daum cafes. Um, this was um, on uh, Daum Agora, which was a, a particular sort of, um, I want to say, message board blog circle type thingy that dealt specifically with them, um, you know, matters of economics and, and banking and stuff. Um, and through his postings, Minerva came be quite popular. Um, and people sort of latched on to his writings. Um, and, you know, if it was a, you know, a, a dictatorship, you could quite easily see the government becoming quite wary of someone all of a sudden getting quite popular and wanting to take him out. Um, the fact was that it was sort of, you know, 2010 in, in South Korea, not North Korea, when all this happened. Which is another incident that kind of raised these issues was the Chunan submarine, uh, the Chunan sinking of people that I think is when they came up with the spreading of false information because there were conspiracy theories that the South Korean government was involved and I is that when that law actually came in or actually no the law came in related to elections I think in 2008 or even earlier where one of the one of the political parties I'm not too familiar with this because it's been a while since I wrote about it um, one of the political parties was really concerned about their opposition having a lot of um, support online. So I think they, um, they used some election drama, some election-related drama to pass through these, the, the real ID law. You could, well, it's not actually the real ID law. It's a, a law that, that um, large internet portals must keep users real information and another law saying that lying on the internet is illegal and the other things that they're using now. I think it was in 2008 or 2006. So the laws have been sitting on the books and they were use, looking for an opportunity to use them and I think Minerva was the first major opportunity in which they, those laws were exercised. Yeah, and no, I think the actual impetus for those laws stems back to the election of Nomu Hyun, um, who sort of scraped through in the last couple of days because of a large amount of support uh, on the internet from, from younger people. Um, and yeah, I think it was 2006 
because no Hyun got in, but of course the actual parliament was um, in the hands of the Grand National Party, his opposition. So they sort of passed the law um, in, in in retribution, <laughs> if you will. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, and the defama defamation issue is a concern for me at Korea Bridge because, you know, I want to have honest conversations about how good is a restaurant or reviews of the places that, that our users frequent. Uh, but technically, my understanding is that any negative comment about any commercial entity should be taken down if that commercial entity so requests. Is that your understanding? Yeah, because... Um Defamation and uh, those kind of laws in Korea are defined as something that you publish which harms someone else's business. doesn't matter if it's true or doesn't matter if it's false, just if it harms their business in some way, then it's grounds for a lawsuit. But I would say that um, the, 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 the claimant, the plaintiff, um, has, to, has to show under fairly strict conditions that they have actually lost something as a result of your posting um, and so I don't think people should feel that you know as soon as they're contacted by a restaurant to take down this horrible review that they should necessarily take it down straight away um, in, in un, under Korean law you know the, the plaintiff really has a strict set of guidelines that they have to follow to show that they have suffered loss as a result of your posting um, and if they can't well then your comment stands yeah but the practicality is that very possibly it did cause damage you know if, if it's a local Pusan restaurant here and someone says oh, the, I found a rat in the kitchen or whatever and people stop going there it could cause real damage and how much is going to cost me just to defend myself and how much grief so well again I mean I wouldn't be I wouldn't want to do anything until at least I was contacted by a lawyer you know the the angry owner of the restaurant ringing up you know one afternoon is one thing being contacted by a lawyer perhaps is is you know the first step along the way of perhaps taking it down or coming to some sort of resolution um, but you know I mean just because you know the, like I say the owner rang you doesn't mean that there wasn't a rat in your soup yeah well if I get any complaints I'll just send them to you Stafford <laughs> I'll be glad to take them on all right so now we've taken care of privacy and defamation let's remake the Korean internet what's the plan Matthew well, Designing um, websites that, you know, improve yeah. on Korean web design. What does that mean? Well, basically, what I'm trying to do now is to push the idea of responsive web design, which means that, um, which becomes especially important in this age where you have the iPad, the iPhone, lots of different smartphones, and people with, with uh, screens of many different sizes and shapes. They're it gets to be a really big deal to have a website that looks good on all of those different platforms. One of the things that people have been doing, one of the things that companies have been doing most recently is to make several different websites, two or three of them, one that looks good on the on a smartphone screen, one that looks good on an iPad screen, one that looks good on a computer screen. But there is a more simple solution and one that I've been boning up on and trying to sell to potential clients now, which is responsive web design. It's kind of like a fundamentalist renaissance of the internet. Because originally HTML and CSS2 were the original languages of the internet, and they were designed to be platform and display independent. You, should, you were supposed to be able to define things semantically and have them display on uh, many different screens at a user's discretion. But over in during the 90s, and I guess the early 2000s, designers, uh, web designers, graphic designers, got really picky about individual pixels and how everything should look exactly the same no matter where you were, where you were, what computer you were using, what uh, browser you were using. So the push for the last 10 or so years has been uh, making your web design look exactly the same no matter where it is. However, now that we have really tiny screens on our smartphones and we have mid-sized screens on iPads and Android tablets, that is becoming impossible once again. So, using um, 
using the principles of responsive web design, I can develop websites that look good both on your smartphone, on your computer at home, and you don't have to do any uh, multiple web designs or anything like that. And incidentally, it also precludes the use of a lot of Flash and precludes the use of a lot of um, a lot of uh, JavaScript and stuff that don't that does not work well with other web services. What do you build so in? Huh? What What do you build in? Do you build in like Do you have a content management system you work with? Do you do HTML5, um, PHP? My preferred content management system is Drupal, but I also use WordPress sometimes because I guess you use you use Drupal for. I am. I am a Drupaler. Oh, great. There's not too many of them out here in Korea. More and more, but still not a lot. But, it, you know, it's a love-hate relationship. It's um, <laughs> unlimited and incredibly flexible, but it will break your heart sometimes. Yeah, yeah, sometimes. So, um, and with Drupal, you can make themes and... Uh, you can make them in HTML5 or HTML4. It just depends on uh, what fits, fits your, uh, your requirements. So uh, basically, I've been trying to do that and trying to convince potential clients of the benefits of making uh, adjustable. Well, I guess maybe I should explain more what responsive web design is. Basically, it's adjustable web design. So your website will shrink down to look good at a small screen size and grow to continue to look good at a large screen size. And we'll hit an upper limit where it does not grow anymore, so it maintains its good look. Not to mention that it will work on browsers other than Microsoft Internet Explorer. Yes, it will look good on every browser. It'll look good on Internet Explorer 6, but it'll also look good on Internet Explorer 9 and Chrome. And you know what? I don't care anymore about Internet Explorer 6. If someone is still using Internet Explorer 6, I don't want them to visit. <laughs> Although they're probably going to be in a PC bong and they might have no other choice, but... Uh. Yeah, you know, back in like 1998, 1999, there used to be a time when people would detect a browser and then redirect old browsers to an upgrade page. I think maybe that's something that people should start doing again. And uh, also, um, I think it was last week, I read an article where the Korean government is trying to discourage the use of Internet Explorer 6 now. Finally. Like some sort of initiative... Well, it's not secure. I mean, for a country that makes you install so much extra software to log into your bank or whatever site, to use such an insecure browser just doesn't make sense. Well, that's secure, security by obfuscation. You know, if you actually manage to download all of these ActiveX controls and get into the bank, you're probably safe. <laughs> you know, if you crash your, your computer beforehand, well, that's, that's a safety. That's a feature, not a bug. <laughs> security through perseverance. A hacker would just move on and try to go. <laughs> Matt, you're coming kind of low again. Poor customer is stuck trying to access his actual bank account. He won't give up for eight hours, and then you know he's actually the authentic user. <laughs> yeah, I think when when you talk about re renewing the Korean internet or remaking the Korean internet, um, the the removal of the public security certificate is the first step. Um, um, yeah, it's a a a a poor implementation of, of security that. You know, Korea suffers because it was a, an early adopter, if you will. Um, you know, it decided to go one way. The rest of the world sort of stepped back and went, mm, "Actually, no, we'll go this way." Um, and no one sort of bothered to look what the rest of the world was doing because it suited them fine with Internet Explorer six, um, and it's and just it's, persevered. Yeah, yeah. There's kind of a funny story about that. Um, Korea was making uh, some legislation national legislation trying to mandate the security for all banks around the same time that the US was restricting the exportation of the strongest encryption I think RSA 256 mm -hmm. something at that time so the US was exporting that and so Korea didn't have access to it so they decided not to go with SSL and instead to go with their own homebrewed encryption scheme and it, by law, it's mandated that all computer banking have that kind of homebrew encryption scheme, which now 
10, 15 years later is out of date and holding the entire country back. And well, the security still stands, stands, but, but the, the, um, the implementation, implementation is, is what's, what's screwing it up. It up. You know, you yeah, can't you actually can do it without, without doing ActiveX. Active yeah. Yeah, because uh, SSL encryption wasn't really finalized at that time, I think. So ActiveX seemed like a nice alternative. Um, I wanted to ask about all these homebrewed solutions that Korea has, because Korea has kind of its own virus checker with OnVirus, its own word processor with uh, Hangul. Do you think this has served Korea well or held it back? Um, well, it's kind of a hard question to answer. Um, I've, I'm familiar with the uh, OnLab virus checker more than I am with Hangul word processor because I actually know some guys who work there at that company. They, I asked them the question if OnLabs was um, holding Korea back or better or worse than others, and they said that they're, they feel like uh, OnLabs is um, secondary to other virus solutions because they don't really, they feel like the company doesn't do enough vi proactive virus identification and um, research on their own. They just wait for information to come from companies outside of Korea and then they implement their own solution. So they're always like one step behind. I think that I think that is kind of well that kind of makes them a little bit behind but not really not that far behind. Yeah, I wouldn't say OnLabs is, has kept Korea behind. I think they're a, a separate sort of, you know, they're just a provider of a service, just like Symantec or any other virus company. Um, Hana, Han, Hansoft, or Hana Word, on the other hand, um, I think a lot of these things, just like the security aspect, um, Korea adopted these things because they were a little bit ahead of everyone else and needed a solution, and so it was developed sort of in-house. Um, and sort of over the co course of the late 90s, early 2000s, you know, Korea was going in a different direction than the rest of the world when it came to the internet. Um, sort of bring in 2010, bring in the iPhone, bring in things like Facebook, and the Korean use of the internet and the world's use of the internet are again starting to meet in the same place. Um, and Koreans are, are, are very quickly finding out that there are better solutions than, you know, Naver or Hana Word. Um, and, and things like that. Um, I mean, the use of Hana Word over the last year and a half, for instance, has dropped dramatically in terms of you know the things that I you know have to do. The government has mandated that every form has to be now in Hana Word, but also in PDF and in .doc, um, which is a blessing when you go to immigration's website now. <laughs> which that was always the bugbear. You know, you'd go to immigration to download the application form to stay for another year, and you'd have to find a computer that would open the bloody thing. Um, you know, yeah, like I say, I think it's, it's, it's a merging or a coming together of, of the way Korea uses the internet and, and computers in general and the rest of the world. I think we're all sort of meeting uh, once again in, in the middle of the road, if you will. Yeah, that's, uh, that's something that's always really frustrated me about Korea's approach to computing is that um, they always make... They, well, they historically they've always made things just for Koreans. They don't want to, they don't <laughs> want to um, they don't think globally when they're designing something. Mm. Although I think one of Korea's products that really is kind of a, a global leader is Kakao. Kakao talk, you know, someone the other day was saying, hey, I want to be able to text my daughter who's moving to France or whatever, uh, and they're in the States. And how can I text them for free? And the first thing that came to mind was cow talk. Yeah, but that's kind of a, a product of the Android OS setup. Cacao talk is only a global, globally offered service because it has to be, because it needs to be sold on the Android marketplace, and the Android marketplace is global. And now that Google they, Plus has Huddle, it could kill cacao. Well, again, well, Huddle's not available in Korea yet. Well, thanks to you, I've been able to use it. <laughs> that one copy of the APK I've been circulating, <laughs> circulating around. 
Now, oh. that's not a Korea issue, is it? That's a outside of the U.S. issue? Yeah. yeah why why do they do that? Well, I think Google Plus is still uh, in, a, in what Google's calling a limited field trial, quote-unquote. They don't use the term beta anymore. Oh, come on. Gmail was in beta for, what, <laughs> 10 years? We can deal with a little... We're used to it. Yeah, but I think they're trying to limit it just a little bit to uh, try to work through any issues. That it has, and, I and I do wonder about how, how it will scale, uh, because this, uh, Google Hangout, it has pretty much completely replaced Skype for me. Uh, it just works better, uh, and for my needs, I've, I'm, I had some premium Skype services that I'm quickly getting rid of. Uh, but, you know, there's 30 million people using Google Plus now. What about when there's a billion people or as many people who are using Skype? But then you've heard for you, I mean, if anyone can handle it, you've got to think Google can, and you heard about them buying all sorts of cable for years now. Is this what it was for? Oh, I think they're just, they're, I mean, I think they're just buying up bandwidth left, right, and center because they don't know what they're going to use it for. Um, you know, uh, like anything, I think Google Plus probably started off as something that they threw against the wall and, and it stuck, you know. Um, I, actually, I was, I was kind of a bit worried to find out that Google has stopped um, labs. Google Labs is about to disappear. Um, Oh. And so I, I can't help but think maybe some of that throwing spaghetti against the wall and seeing what stick, you know, is, is going to go away when it comes to Google. I had yeah. not heard that. They're just stopping? Yeah, I, I think you'll be able to still use, like, Google Labs products, but I don't think they're going to actively, you know, keep putting their people's things in there anymore. Because <laughs> I think Labs, as a result of their 20% um, their policy, you know, employees of Google are... Uh, allowed to devote 20% of their work time to their own pursuits and their own solutions and ideas for things. Um, and the good ones end up being in, in Google Labs. Um, you know, I mean, that's how we got things like Google Talk and... Um, what was that thing that, that disappeared very quickly? What was it? Um, Wave? Yeah, yeah. Wave. See, but then oh. Wave you know, has been implemented in Google Docs now, which I thought was quite cool, how you can do the real-time editing and, and chat and stuff in Docs. So... You know, I think Google Plus is probably a, a culmination of a lot of things that have been going on for some time in Google, and there probably is has been quite a lot of thought as to how to place it all together, and you know they're just sort of slowly letting it out there and see what happens. So, what else has your geek attention these days in Korea or outside? I played with the Galaxy Tab 10.1 today for the first time. Got my greasy little fingers all over it. And so, uh, under, underwhelmed, to be honest. Underwhelmed. Um, it's nice and thin and light. Um, compared to an iPad? Compared to, well, I've got an iPad 1, so I live in the land of, of chunky goodness. Um, <laughs> but, um, yeah, if... Meh. That's <laughs> all I can really say. Um, I don't know. The, the, they seem to have put an emphasis on um, landscape mode. Um, you do most of the stuff sort of sideways. Um, whereas with my tablets, you know, with my iPad, with my Galaxy Tab 7, I like portrait mode for some reason. I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Um, but, yeah, a lot of stuff happens in in, in landscape mode sort of on the side. Um, and I... Uh, nah, nah. I was going to buy one. I, I seriously went into the shop to buy one. And um just underwhelmed, really. Didn't Samsung say they were going to just stop production on that and just completely redesign everything to compete with the iPad 2? Well, I, I, I think they initially um, stopped the production of 10.1 a couple of months ago, well, almost a year ago now, um, to compete with iPad 2. This is a result of their first stop and redesign, um, hmm. but it wouldn't, put, wouldn't, put a pass, it wouldn't surprise me if they were doing it again. Um, but they had a huge event in Gangnam last week uh, with um, Chelsea football team. Chelsea were in town, um, and they all gathered in Gangnam and had a launch of the, the tab, and there were all sorts of um, famous football-type players playing with tabs. Um, <laughs> but at the end of the day, no, I, I, um, I much prefer my 7-inch one um, for its utility. It's a bit, it's got a bit more heft to it as well. I, I found that the the ten point one, 
for its 10 inches of, of screen goodness was quite flaky. You know, I'd, I'd think I'd drop it and destroy it, whereas with my iPad, with my 7-inch my Galaxy Tab, I think it could survive a couple of drops, you know, from a, a reasonable height. Mm. So, Meanwhile, the Galaxy S keeps chugging along, yeah? Ah! Superstar. <laughs> And the other thing was, I, I today I, I needed a new watch, so I bought a um, an iPod Nano and, watch? and put wow. it on a watch strap. So now I've got an iPod Nano watch. It's very cool. Hmm. So I was going to spend two hundred bucks on a watch, so I might as well buy an iPod Nano. How much is a Nano costing these days? Two hundred dollars, two hundred thousand one. How much storage? Eight gig. So you'll use it as an MP3 player? I'll probably use it as a watch. And a watch, just a well, watch. I mean, I, I've got I've got two phones and and two tablets to use as MP3 players. But if I was going for a jog, I'd rather be uh, using that than my my more expensive hardware. Oh, true, true. I think I think I think you'd have to find earphones with a long enough cord, hmm. though. Yeah. I think that's going to be the, an issue. You know, whipping. The well, cords you could also make it an armband. Aroma. Run the cord up your whole arm and across your shoulder, and sort of gaffer and tape it up your arm, and yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's a real gig solution. Gaff tape right there. There's hey. a, in my I, case, there's a. I've been reading about this. Um, how do you say? A revolution against Naver. There's a, some Korean blog post going around saying that. Uh, Naver manipulates search results in order to try to sway public opinion. And they edit a lot of unsavory things out of their search results. So there's been a kind of a little bit of a movement to go Google for Korean internet users. Which what is their presumed their, agenda? Is it commercial, political? Um, it's political, usually. So like... Uh, like during the search, during the beef protest in 2008, there were um, there were like the number one, two, and three search results related to that were like impeachment, Emang Bak, and Emang Bak Sai World page, and then later it was found that all the references to President Lee left, and uh, for some reason the Beastie Boys were now the number one search term, which I don't know about you, but I haven't really listened to the Beastie Boys lately. And like the autocomplete function on Naver is very important to a lot of people who use Naver, but um, they use it as like a pulse on what's going on. And um, during recent re regional elections, Han Myung-suk was a former prime minister and it doesn't have his name anywhere in top search results where it normally would have near the election time his name just disappeared from top search results. I I got most of this information from the blog neilsfootman.com Footman's Frothings. Niels Footman is, is my uh, internet nemesis, but go on. Oh, well, in that case, I think the <laughs> article is... In that case, weird. I'm going to invite him to this hangout right now. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he's. Uh, it seems really interesting, and I, I would like personally. I would personally like to see a lot of people go from using Navy to using Google because that improves the service for everyone, both for us and for people who are trying to use um, Google to find Korean language information. So. Um, yeah, that's something interesting that I... I yeah, I don't know. I mean, I've always thought that it's uh, horses for courses. If you're looking for something in Korea, in Korean, you know, I go to Naver, um, and I'm probably going to get a better result than if I'd went to Google. But if I'm looking for something outside of Korea, um, you know, go to Goog. Um, but mm -hmm. having seen these results where, you know, the, the timestamp is exactly the same on, on the two trending, you know, the, the results showing the trending topics... Um, you know, one's mm. faith, as as small as it was in Naver, um, is quickly disappearing. 
Yeah. So I'm just and curious, uh, why is Footman your internet nemesis? Uh, we don't know. It just it happened. I've, I've <laughs> is it is it a mutual thing? Uh, no, we no, we we both um, we both write for uh, Nanumi.net, uh, which is a uh, a blog that tries to bring together um, English Korean English Korean bloggers. That doesn't sound right. Um, English speaking Korean, but no people in Korea who speak English and blog. Um, mm. sort of bring together their posts in one place um, and occasionally get them translated into Korean and, and share with our Korean audiences. Nanumi.net. Check it out. Well, we'll have to get Nils on here next time. Uh, it's been a pleasure talking Geek Talk. And uh, Matthew, I, I've been discussing with a few people about the possibility of creating a Drupal uh, hangout um, with uh, Korean users because I know a handful and sometimes it's fun to just talk dr Drupal Geek Talk with people who understand. Oh uh, yeah, I'd be interested in something like that. Very cool. Mm -hmm. And um, I'm experimenting for the rest of the summer with different uh, formats, different kinds of shows. If anyone uh, has any interest in playing around with this kind of format, it's you know I can't believe we only have two viewers with a stellar geek panel like this. But I'm sure I, I'm will probably one of them, and Matt's the other, isn't he? <laughs> Well, yeah. I think I closed that window, but uh, <laughs> um, but I'm sure the hordes will enjoy listening to the recording. Uh, before we wrap up, and I'll let you guys go. Any uh, parting thoughts? Um, I think the really good point that uh, Stafford brought up earlier is that Korea seems to be now it seems to be separated from the rest of the world's technology and internet for a long time now, but it does seem to be merging back together with the success of the Android operating system and lots of other Google services. So I think that as far as our perspective goes as expats in Korea, Korea will become an easier place to exist on the internet. And uh, I also think, I also honestly think it will help Korean internet users to be more feel more connected to the rest of the world when they're only using the same services. So I think that's a good point that we can take away from this and I'm really looking forward to how that works out in the future. That's that's a lovely note to end on. I, I hesitate to ask Stafford for any comment. I don't know how we can <laughs> top that. <laughs> um, no, I, I, I think, um, yeah, I, I think Matt nails, nails it. That's, that was great. All right, well, uh, on that note, uh, we'll stay, look forward to staying tuned to uh, what happens in the tech world here in Korea. We'll be back with a Hangout next week about something that I'll try to publicize more than a few hours beforehand, but, you know, hanging out is hanging out. Have a great week. Okay, see ya. Bye-bye.